session. I want to speak of the prodigal son and add something about the love of the father represents. We have left the prodigal son at the moment when he walked away from home, from love, into the unknown that appeared to him as a place of glory and enjoyment. And indeed, as long as he had money, as long as he could be surrounded by people who want to profit from what he possessed, everything was, went well. Isn't that what happens also to all of us when from the depths of communion with God, from being part of God's own family, and I'm not speaking of parishes or the church, but of the communion of people who have an experience of God and for whom he is the guide and the light and the meaning of life and life itself, we remain alone, possessed with all the strengths we imagine we have. And then we give, we give generously all that we have taken away from our communion with God and with our own depths. And as long as we have something to give, the joy and the thoughts and the openness, people flock around us. But the moment comes if we are not plugged on the divine, on the eternal, that what we had in the beginning, what we had stolen from paradise, dwindles, and then nothing is left but me myself, and people around me discover that what is left is not worth communion with it. Very often, most of the time, people do not realize that what they receive from one another is what comes from people's communion with God, either directly, in prayer, in silence, or indirectly, through communion with other people. And a moment comes when we are empty. This is what happened to the prodigal son. He found himself without money, without means of attracting people to him, there was nothing he could give. Because not only didn't he have anything, but he was nothing. And this is a thought which I think we must ponder on. Who am I? Am I someone or am I an emptiness that gets filled one way or another. I remember a man already in old age telling me that all his life he wanted to die because he felt he was no one. Oh, he had been a variety of things. He had been a member of a loving family, and he had adjusted to this family, being exactly what was expected of him. But it was not him. It was what was expected of him. 
Then he went to school, and he met with the expectations of the school. And having learned at home to adjust, he adjusted well. And he had a persona, but it was not him. It was what people, the school, home, his comrades expect of him. Then he went on, and from year to year, moving from school to university, from university to the war, from the war to uh, the times of peace, and so forth, he was perfectly adjusted. People saw that he was in the right place and the right person. And he knew that he was perhaps in the right place, but he was not any person. He was not playing the comedy in the sense that he was not trying to deceive people. But he had learned so to adjust that he was what people expected him to be. And when old age came, he said to me, in the course of 90 years of life, I have never been myself or I have never been anyone. And this is what I have understood now. And in addition to this, he said to me, all my life I had wished to die because the persona whom I presented to the people around me did not exist. It was not me. And the person who could have lived and existed did not exist at all. And after a long life, 90 years of age, he found himself an emptiness. This is what happened, oh, in small, over a short period, to the prodigal son. At home, he had been himself. No one expected him to be anything, and so he could be what he was. But when he found himself in the outer world, it was different. He had to meet the expectation of people. And the more perfectly he met these expectations, the more unreal he became himself. Unreal in the sense that he became aware that it was not him. And one day, all he had to give that had been borrowed, and nearly said stolen from his home, was spent. And people looked at him and saw that he was nothing but an empty shell. Nothing and they turned away from him. Not only because he no longer could provide them with meals and entertainment, but because there was no point in communion with him in any way. There was no one to commune with. He looked around. He had to survive. His body claimed food, shelter, clothes, and he tried to find at least work, but the kind of work he would have received otherwise was no longer offered him, because he meant nothing anymore to anyone, and all they offered him was to look after pigs, that is, after the animals that were considered as unclean, impure, polluting. That was his level. Nothing but communion with ritual 
pollution. And then he came to his senses. He realized that there was nothing he could create in himself or borrow, that the only thing he could do is to try to recapture something, or not everything, at least something of what he had at home, that he could, he had to go home. He could no longer be a son in the household, a brother, but he could be perhaps a hireling, working hands, pay for his keep by his work, and feel that that was all he was, but that at least he was and would be no longer total emptiness, but just a hireling, fed and clothed, and perhaps paid. And he started on his journey. We think of this journey as the text presents us with it, in a telescopic manner, as though he took the decision, collected himself, and went on his way. But this way was long. It was a whole mental, emotional process, and not only a question of covering miles. And he walked. He had nothing but rags on him. The beautiful clothes had gone. He probably had sold them. These clothes represented the false personality he was. And he sold them because they existed no longer any more than his personality did. He walked, and all the way he thought of what he had lost by abandoning his father, his mother, his brother, the servants of the house, the retainer, all the surrounding that had been giving him a support. Then he had been someone, the son of the house, he shared with others their feelings, their emotions, their thoughts, their work. Now he was going back empty in the hope that something could be given him to fill this emptiness. And all the way he rehearsed his confession. He repeated to himself what he would say to his father the truth about himself. Father, I'm not worthy to be called a son. Receive me as one of the hirelings, one of the paid hands who work for you. He expected nothing else. It is not only that he expected food and shelter, but a surrounding that had been familiar, in which he could root himself again. Even not in the terms that had been those of his childhood or early youth, but it was home, even if he was on the fringe of it. And he repeated this confession continuously, as it were, or oh, not in words. His heart spoke these words. His whole body and soul spoke these words. His mind had been cleared, and he saw, I am nothing, but they can make something of me. In the couple of years during which he had been away, being great among the parasites, his father had been thinking of him, 
Because to give one's life as the Father had given his life meant that he could never forgive, sorry, forget his son. He had seen him walk away, becoming smaller and smaller in the distance and disappear at the turn of the road. And time and again, he probably stood by the door of his little house, looking into the distance, hoping that one moment will come when the boy will reappear. He didn't know how. He didn't know in what guise. And suddenly, he saw a beggar, a mendicant, covered with rugs, coming in a faltering manner, tired, tired to exhaustion, with a soul even more desperately tired than his body. He saw him and recognized him at once, heart speaking to heart, and he rushed towards him, and he sees him in his arms, and the boy fell to his feet. and started his confession. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. But at that moment, the father interrupted him. He did not allow him to say, receive me as one of your hirelings, because he could be an unworthy son he could in no way become a worthy stranger. He took him in his arms, brought him to the house. The household rushed out probably, rejoicing that the boy had come back, and in horror of what they saw. And the father said something which is so often misrepresented, I, begin, I believe, in the translation of the text. He said, bring the first robe. In many a translation we find the best robe to clad him in novelty and beauty. But that was a return to the strange land, to the land when he wore clothes that were a comedy and not reality. What he said is, bring his first robe, the one he discarded when he left, the one that he let fall off his shoulders to the ground, but which I have collected, which has have folded, and kept in a drawer and taken out every day to hold against my heart, to kiss, to bury my face into it, because that was all that was left of my boy. It is that robe that was brought, and the boy put it on. And he could look at himself, and a miracle had happened. He had not been given beautiful clothes that were alien to him. He was wrapped again in his own past. This robe was what he had been, real the child of the household. He looked at himself and he was back. He looked at himself and the years in the strange country didn't exist anymore. 
they would have existed had, been, had he been dressed up. But it was his old robe he was wearing. The rest was a nightmare. And then there was the encounter with his mother, if she was alive, with the workers of the farm, with the retainers, with the servants, with the friends, with whoever was there, and with his brother. His brother, if you have understood what I meant in my last talk, who now came and saw what the life his brother had led, had made of him in compassion, with pain. And he saw the robe he was wearing and recognized the boy who had been his brother. They met again, or perhaps not, at a depth. They had to learn a great deal about one another. The father could bridge the gap by a leap of love and tenderness. The brother had to learn something more about himself as also about his brother and his father. He was back at home. And all that was a miracle of what love is. Love is a word that covers so many things, so many. We use it in so many ways. Let us think of the way in which we can use it in God's terms. There is a writer of old who, speaking of the creation of the world, said, this is what happened between the Father and the Son before the world was called out of naught. The Father said, My Son, let us create a world and man in our image. And the Son said, Yes, Father. And the Father continued, Yes, but man will betray his vocation. He will fall away. He will die. And you will have to become man and die his death for him to be saved. And the son said, Yes, Father, let it be so. And the world was created. So the first step in the existence of the world was an act of love divine that was a sacrifice. The father bringing his own son to the altar of sacrifice. And there is an icon, an ancient icon <coughs> of Greece in which we see the nativity of Christ. <coughs> We see the mother of God. We see Joseph. We see the cave. But instead of the manger, we see made of pink stones an altar of sacrifice. And on this altar of sacrifice lies the newborn 
Son of God, the Son of Mary. The birth of Christ was the beginning of death. But this death was already a victory over separation from God and the kind of death that would be ultimate separation. In an act of love, he had taken upon himself human mortality, the consequences of the fall of man away from the source of life, which is God. Commenting on the baptism of Christ in the Jordan by St. John the Baptist, a writer has said that John the Baptist called upon all the sinners to merge into the waters of Jordan with a prayer to cleanse them, them from sin, from evil, from ultimate death. And these waters became heavy with the mortality and the murdering power of sin. And when, came, when Christ came and was baptized by John in the Jordan, he merged himself in what old legends, legends used to call the waters of death. These waters that had cleansed every repentant sinner were heavy with their sins and mortality. And this mortality clung to the humanity of Christ in the way in which a dye clings to, pervades cloths. And Christ, the incarnate Son of God, came out wearing upon himself, pervaded with the mortality of all those who had sinned before and were sinning and would indeed sin in the future. That was love. It began before the creation of the world in this divine council in which Christ accepted death because God so loved the world and it was now being enacted. When we think of love, we do not think habitually of the way in which one can give oneself unreservedly. Too often when you read literature, you see that love consists in taking. You are mine. It's a thought, a phrase, that is spoken silently or audibly by the two sides. The two sides take possession of the other. And when this love falters, then comes resentment, jealousy, because it is not gift of self. It's an act of possession of the other. We read in the Bible that when Eve 
was created Adam looked at her and in none of the translations one can see the sense of it and said I am man and this is woman it was something more in the Hebrew the word used is ish and isha which means the feminine and the masculine are the same they looked at one another and recognized in each other themselves revealed to them in incredible purity and beauty it is me as I had never known myself I have never suspected this beauty unutterable incomparable it is I but revealed as beauty as holiness this was spoken by both in this word of Ish and Isha and it is only after the fall that they recognize that they are different from one another Saint Methodius of Patara I think says that in the beginning they looked at each other rejoicing and saying I am sorry I am ego myself and he or she is alter ego the other myself but other not in terms of differentiation but of recognition of self face to face and it is the fall that has resulted in people looking at each other and saying I am ego I am myself and this one is the other one a rupture a separation and then love may well become possession enslavement it's no longer the fulfillment in freedom in being one's own self and I told you earlier that in Sanskrit the word priya that means freedom means love and being loved that is a miracle of being oneself both there are caricatures of love the most frightening can be read in C.S. Lewis's book in which the old devil tries to understand what love means and he says I can't understand the enemy the enemy being Christ he says that he loves people and he does not try to possess them and speaking to his nephew he says I love you because I love you I want you to be mine I want you to possess you I want nothing of you to remain outside of me I want to devour you completely so that you are in me and nowhere else I'm not quoting exactly but I'm telling you what thought is expressed this is what we have made of love but this is not what we find 
in love divine. And this is not the love which we could find in the father or the prodigal son. Like our heavenly father, he accepted deaths that the son could live. And the son accepted deaths that mankind could live. The father of the prodigal son had given all he had, but that was nothing compared to accepting, to be denied in his very existence, killed metaphysically by a boy who had no use for his existence anymore. We must give thought to this subject of the way in which the father loved his son and to the way in which we speak of loving one another and want to take possession of the other. Love should be freedom, but not the freedom of estrangement, a freedom of mutual ignorance, a freedom that allows both to be fulfilled in a total gift of self to the other, unreservedly, a joy so perfect. And so, when you look at this parable of the prodigal son, <clears throat> You can see the complex relationship between two humans and beyond it the relationship between God and his creatures. The love of God is gift of self, total unreserved. It is death. It is acceptance of not being through a given person. But at the same time, is victory, a triumphant victory over estrangement and over death itself. I would like to leave these thoughts with you and I hope that I have contributed something to your thinking and feeling about this parable. Maybe I haven't been clear enough Maybe so many things are blurred, but I don't think I can put them into a more logical, precise way. It is something one can experience inwardly. One cannot put it in logical terms because we live in a world where it is not love that rules. In a world in which we must struggle and struggle for love to conquer in ourselves 
in others by giving ourselves unreservedly. In a world that God has so loved that he gave his only begotten Son that the world may be saved. This is the world in which we live, and this is our mission in this world. We are sent into this world like sheep among the wolves. To be devoured if necessary, but to bring the message. In a way, we are all shepherds. In a way, we are all called to watch over our neighbor, our brother, our sister. For them to be saved from destruction. One of the early memories of my childhood, which I spent in today's Iran, which was Persia then, is that of the vastness of space. And in this vastness, a shepherd with a few sheep around him, around him, space, above him the infinity of the sky, he as frail, as helpless in a way, as a sheep around him, with the difference that frail and weak, as small as they were, he had a love for the sheep and was prepared to fight the wolf, to fight the tiger, to be wounded and killed to protect this little flock. Such are we also in a world full of danger, full of hatred, full of complexity, as small as small can be, and yet possessed of a quality which makes us akin to the living God. Love to the point of ultimate sacrifice. I will end my talk at this point and leave you as you have done to meditate, to think your own thoughts. I hope that what I have said will help you. If not, forgive me. <laughs>